Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, like all post-lunch uh, chairs, I have the unpleasant task of having to declare the lunch hour over. And uh, I'm sure you're ready to go to hear our, our uh, panel, a very accomplished one, uh, as were others, of course. Uh, comprising uh, two very distinguished uh, speakers, uh, we have uh, Amrita, uh, Dr. Amrita uh, Sholan. She's a senior teaching fellow of SOAS. Uh, she's interested in colonialism, nationalism, patriarchy, uh, religion, in partition, uh, uh, and her interest in partition actually stems from her concern about transformation of religion and legal structures under common law frameworks in South Asia. Amrita is the author of uh, A Question of Community published from uh, Kolkata, Samya 2001. And on my left is uh, uh, Professor uh, 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 P.R. Kumaraswamy, who was gracious enough to come to our think tank, ISAS, yesterday and speak to uh, another important topic, uh, which was on more contemporary, what, which was on uh, Prime Minister Modi turning west, etc. We had a very, very stimulating discussion, and I'm looking forward to another. Uh, he teaches contemporary Middle East at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, is the author of is, uh, India's, India's Israel Policy, uh, published by Columbia University Press 2010, and Squaring the Circle, Mahatma Gandhi and the Jewish National Home, New Delhi, ICWA and KW 2018. He's also an honorary director of Midlands Institute, uh, New Delhi. We will begin with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Shodan, and uh, uh, you know, for the next 25 minutes, uh, the floor is Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start saying we thank you to all the organizers and the staff for making this. Um, uh, great opportunity for me to share ideas here. Could you speak to the mic? Oh, yeah. <coughs> to, um, to provide this great opportunity so I can share my ideas here and uh, to create these South South links uh, so importantly for, for grounded today. Um, uh, many kudos for that. This paper brings together evidence from suggestions and footnotes, and in a couple of cases from more research in. Uh, the que on the question of um, partition and it, it brings this research on the question of partition shows direct links between India and Palestine. Can the making of these connections give us a new perspective on the partitions that still occupy India and Palestine? So in effect the paper is really in the nature of a research proposal, uh, extended one and I hope you will take it as that and give me lots of questions, suggestions, comments um, that we can take forward. There are many points of comparison between all aspects of the two partitions, from the planning, the proposal, uh, and to its execution, it, the experiences of that execution, as well as in the consequences in the long and short term. By partition, I am referring to the geopolitical divisions in 47 in India. So um, I take Professor Jalal's uh, point very seriously that it's not, really, it's not only about the politics but the continuing divisions in the hearts of people and hearts and minds which, and that's why I said they still occupy us because that's the way in which they do occupy us. Um, so I'm referring to these geopolitical divisions that have permeated uh, in the hearts and minds and the truncated partition of Palestine in 48. These divisions were made to create homes for Muslims in Pakistan, Jews in Israel, and for all the rest, Hindu um, in national religious, um, sorry, all the rest that is Hindu in India, and Arab and the rest in Palestine. So that's, I want to draw attention to these kind of different divisions that uh, are, um, that's how they were framed. The division of population in national religious communities can be traced in similar ways in both places in the sociology of colonial knowledge. 
I'm going to argue that over the years of colonial legal and political organizations, a plethora of small community groups were reduced to fundamentally defined singular religious groups. In India, the process has been better documented, and Kohn, Kabiraj, Pandey, and my own earlier work shows that numerous communities with varying fuzzy caste, class, and religious identities were, co were coalesced into the singular fundamentally defined religious groups of Hindu and Muslim. In Palestine, research on British colonial administration has not looked at the sociology of knowledge in quite the same way. However, work by Yair Rawlin, Robert Omarza, Asaf Likhovsky have shown the presence of multi multiple communities from late Ottoman times. In British reckoning, these are reduced to Jewish, Christian, and Muslim initially. Likhovsky suggests that after the 30s, British reckoning in Palestine changes from religion to nationality, and the Christians in Palestine are counted with the Muslims as Arabs, whereas the Jews are treated as the separate nationality. The creation of these blocks as separate nations makes partition then seem like a sensible decision. Comparing the histories of these singular communal definitions um, might open up questions regarding the constructions of the so I want to problematize the very basic divisions that are being seen uh, as the cause for or the solution, for, for which partition is the solution. Perhaps a prehistory for this kind of ethnic nationalism that Professor Robson was talking about earlier. So now I outline some of this history, how and where were these singular definitions forged. I suggest one primary locale is in the legal arena. Roman law thinking, as opposed to common law, lay behind the British institution of law in India starting in 1772, with Hastings employing the Roman imperial ideal in his rule over India. Remember all those marble statues and togas of Hastings and William Jones and other imperial figures? The idea was to employ to each people, the Roman law idea is to employ to each people or nation the, um, of the empire, each people, of, all the people of the, the empire, their own laws. So all the national groups are seen as members of these empire, but they should not be uh, forced to follow a uniform law. They should have their own law, especially in personal matters. While these were primarily supposed to be Hindu and Muslim laws in the uh, early 19th, 18th and early 19th century, in practice, they included much caste and customary law of small groups. In Palestine, Ottoman Tanzimat reforms, as well as the revival of Hebrew law, were based on similar Roman law notions of applying their own laws to the people. This led to a plurality of legal jurisdictions with Miller and religious courts, continued by the British from the Ottoman Act. Um, the absence of a uniform civil code often has been blamed by many nationalists for the divisions between citizens in both places. However, scholars like Shermayaram and others have argued that the multiple groups common in India, castes and tribes, created their own governing structures that permitted accommodative community governance, and it permitted fuzzy religious groups, groups to survive sharing practices and common existence outside the state jurisdiction. Could we suggest that the Middle East system also similarly permitted multiple religious groups to survive uh, and prevented the application of a singular fundamentally defined nationalized religious identity. In India from the 1830s, there is reform of legal administration and a decline of caste-based and customary law regimes from 1857 and after Henry Maine's regularization of the laws, codes of procedure were introduced where there is a more stringent application of the singular Hindu and Muslim identities. The reduction of plurality is blamed for the modernization and nationalization of communities. Likowski documents a similar reduction in reliance on religious courts and the rise in popularity of the mandatory courts court system, which the British do set up as parallel to the Ottoman courts. Um, and Mitra Sharafi has also noted the Indianization of statutory and Islamic law throughout the British run territories, 
in her article on colonial law. I mean, so it would seem that the British practices in India, the legal, code, not written codes, but the legal uh, following precedent, this, they collected these laws and uh, used them in other, in Malaysia as well, they used the Anglo written code and in the Sudan, in South Africa and other places. And another crucial place, so that's the law, the legal system where I see this happening. Another crucial place where we see the operation of the singular religious category is in representation in government. In India, the idea of involving locals in provincial governance got a new boost in 1909 after the agitations following the first partition. Um, the Government of India Act of 1909 introduced elections to provincial councils with very limited franchise. In some of these councils, separate electorates were set up for Muslims as well as for professional and landed groups. By 1917, the Montag Chelmsford Report, these separate electorates were considered to provide self-determination to the groups, primarily minorities, who got them. The scheme of representation by religion was extended in 35 and again in the Cabinet Mission Plan of 46. All these acts were trying to ensure that the communal religious groups were represented in government with some parity. It was felt that this protection was necessary in the face of a communal society and in the absence of civic consciousness. The most detailed statement of this may be seen in the Montag Chelsea Report of 1917. Similar proposals were made in 22, a few years later, for a Palestine Legislative Council by Herbert Samuel. The religious groups to be represented on that council at the time were Muslim, Jewish, and Christian. The two men responsible for these ways of representation, Lord Montag in India and Herbert Samuel, were cousins, though of very different Zionist persuasion. So Herbert Samuel supported Zionists, whereas Montag was against it. But they, were, um, they may have had very similar ways of thinking regarding minority representation. And I feel this needs further investigation to see where, what, is the, what are the assumptions they are bringing to the table for uh, equitable representation. Communal electorates have been blamed again by nationalists in the Indian National Congress and organizations like the Arab Committee for the divides in the body politics. In fact, it was the refusal of the Congress in India to accept parity of Muslim groups that led to a breakdown in the governance structures of living together differently, as mentioned earlier also by Professor Jagan. Um, so, so these are the two main places where you can see this operation. Besides the legal system and representative structures of government, knowledge was produced about religious groups as singular bodies through the census, through investigations into riots, and through a prose of otherness in colonial works, in newspaper reports and publications, also using this kind of language for representing community. Besides structures of government, we must also examine the importance of the communities themselves and their processes of nationalization that aided the forging of these singular religious the rise of nationalism and the growth of uh, the Arab, the Indian Congress, the Muslim League, uh, and the Zionist agency are, as the sole representative of their respective communities uh, is very important in the making of this narrative. So I'm not saying it's only from the side of government, it's also popular movements. Um, Devji and Amir Mufti have uh, hinted at similar nationalization processes um, amongst the Jews in the diaspora and Muslims in colonial India. And uh, most histories of the period have begun to focus on these popular processes. But I would like to suggest that the government structures were, governance structures were equally important in laying the parameters of community definitions. Singular religious groups are forged then as the main actors in both Palestine and India by the 40s. The political persona of these groups is also interestingly similar. The groups seen as minorities, the Jews in Palestine and the Muslims in India, take on religious nationalist ideologies. The Hindu in India and the Arab in Palestine become catch-all categories that subsume all the non-Muslims in India, for example, Sikh, Jain, tribals, etc. 
and the non-Jews, the Bedouins, Christian Jews, etc., become classified with the Muslims. This becomes important when demographics ruled the making of partition boundaries. Once the categories of the opposing groups were forged, the governance solution of part partition was judged to be the most useful for managing conflict. Here we find that the model of partition was available through a long practice in international law, as uh, Dr. Katan's thesis demonstrates. The transfer of population between Greece and Turkey, again referred to earlier, was a model that was used to effect a division of population. Geographical separation between Hindus and Muslims was demanded as early as the 1920s in India, even by the Congress in the 1920s, Lala Lajpat Rai demanded partition of populations, not necessarily perhaps a geographical partition, but certainly in terms of uh, uh, government, government. The Birlas talk about it in the 30s and so on. Power sharing models of governance, federation and cantonization existed in both places. These proposals are rejected for partition as separation. And I think that's where uh, uh, earlier also we were saying we do need to make that difference federation and partition. In Palestine, it happens much earlier, uh, the giving up of the cantonization option. As uh, Rosa Elaini has shown by 37, Douglas Harris, a famed Indian civil servant, brought to, uh, who, uh, who was then working in Palestine, brought his experience of partitioning Sindh from Bombay to bear on preparing plans for partitioning Arab and Jewish provinces. He spoke in concrete terms in looking at practical needs like water, electricity, public finances, and suggested subventions as legal ways for states to help each other and be independent. His proposals were accepted by the Bill Commission, and while in Sindh, partition in 35 was still to remain within the same federal government, and therefore the option was more a governance option than an identity. And that's how Harris's plan, uh, proposals fell into the P Commission. Yet this real connection in the planning for partition may help put the Palestine partition plan in some sort of perspective. When studied further, it might give us clues to the thinking behind the, uh, his proposal that perhaps he wasn't even looking at this as an identity issue. Another link in the making of the partition plan, suggested by T.G. Fraser, uh, the person of Reginald Copeland mentioned earlier. Copeland was the primary author of the 37th Commission report and for the, partition, for the partition of Palestine, Professor Copeland was a member of the Round Table, a think tank at Oxford, where he worked on several divided societies like Canada, South Africa, Ireland, and also India. He seems to have indicated in these discussions that societies with Caucasian origins might learn to live together with differences but not non-white societies may not be so civil. Sinanohu Professor's work has investigated Copeland's role to suggest that he was perhaps less crucial in coming up with a plan than what Fraser has uh, suggested. But Copeland sub subsequently wrote a report on India in 1942-46, where he seems to have argued against partition. Thus Copeland as the connecting link between the two partitions may not be sustainable, but again, he merits further research because not many have looked at his, uh, his thoughts and his background, his, uh, his ideas. The British used their experience in India, um, and we hear more about that from Professor Kumar Swami, to refrain from voting for partition in, on Palestine in November at the United Nations. Yet before the UN vote, in September, Ali had already pointed to India as an example for Palestine to follow, as a violent but in the end successful partition. Given the many officers who had served in India and then in Palestine, suggests that a thorough study of their experiences and mindsets could inform us as to the sources of many of the choices they make and the policies they suggest. Another connection is in the pre-partition administration of land law. Again, Alienation of land from peasants was a big issue in India, in Punjab. In 1901, they passed a law for land alienation, and similar laws are passed in or they attempt in Pakistan. Besides the connections in the making of the politics of partition, we find parallels in the manner of the British withdrawal from India and Pakistan. 
all the government figures involved, Atali Bevin, Mount Batson, the provincial governor in Punjab, Jenkins, uh, who were supposed to ensure an orderly withdrawal, were too concerned about the withdrawal and not enough about the order. They dramatically failed in their task, and the role of the governor of Punjab is only now coming into focus. On the, on the other hand, well-governed states like Bahawalpur, Malir Kota, and even the United Provinces, though they saw significant tension and migration, remained peaceful without major violence in 47. The Punjab experience was a failure in governance and demonstrated the actions of a state that had lost its will to govern. A similar refusal to govern prevailed in the last days, last days of the mandate. This pattern of withdrawal from India and Palestine, overseen by Atli, the abstaining from the use of the army, needs to be examined further. The extensive ethnic cleansing that occurred on partition, the expulsion and decimation of unborn populations, and the use of the idea of conquest as justification for rule suggests that popular ideology had some sanctions from the departing colonial armies. The working out of this ideology of conquest is different in the two places, but a close analysis would bear fruit in enunciating and making it explicit. The similar presence of decommissioned World War II soldiers in both places also fed in to the making of similar patterns of organized military action in villages and towns in Punjab and Palestine. A primary aspect of post-partition governance uh, required that the new government in post-partition states deal with their populations and make the citizenship laws. Here, the debates on citizenship, whether by residence and locality or by descent, has similar echoes in both places. Thus, in India, all Hindus have a right to claim citizenship but Muslims have to be residents of India at a certain time to claim this. Similarly in Pakistan for Muslims, while all and then while all Jews have similarly a right to claim citizenship in Israel, Arabs have a time barred right by residents. The history of these very familiar formulations needs to be examined and connections drawn where necessary. Jo Joya Chatterjee has argued for the role of Hindu and Sikh refugees in India after partition driving this uh, ethnic definition of Indian citizenship. I suggest this connection, as the excellent work of Foreman and Kedar has demonstrated how the Indian and Pakistani laws were used as models in Israel. They have documented the case of the Israeli state using the laws of custodian custodianship of refugee property in Pakistan and India to enact laws taking over Palestinian property to house incoming Jewish refugees from Europe. In India and Pakistan, the British wartime legislation regarding enemy alien property was transformed to deal with the property left behind by those who went to the other state. So on 29th August 1947, already within a few weeks, the Joint Defense Council meeting in Lahore sets up an office of the custodian of refugee property on both sides. The custodian was to look after the property that was being left behind by the large-scale migrations. In September of 47, East and West Punjab Evacuee Property Preservation Ordinance was enacted and then extended to Delhi and later other parts of the country. By 1948, this property was being used to house incoming refugees in both states. This law of evacuee property was sent by the bureaucrats to Israel where they enacted similar laws for absentee and they used it similarly to house refugees. This detailed study, it's not my study, but, um, Mr. For, uh, Dr. Foreman and Kidder have published it. This detailed study suggests the possibility of other similar connections between the two places. Further similarities and connections remain to be drawn uh, on post-partition memories and nostalgia. <coughs> Margaret Burkhoy took photographs of the India-Pakistan migration as well as of the Nakba. In fact, those are the pictures on our, uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, and those are the pictures also on our poster. Her pictures of both places have been taken with similar angles, similar compositions, similar focus on individual figures, long uh, horizons, uh, long distance perspectives, etc. Thus creating very similar lasting public memories of both partitions. 
Jonathan Greenberg has shown how memories over the generations vary similarly in both Palestine and India. Comparative work on nostalgia and dangers post reconciliation can guide and mold and inform the way in which we take the politics of partition forward. I want to end with a brief look at the contemporary period where the current regime in India feels as if it is finally fulfilling it as its own partition destiny of being a Hindu nation. Its policies justify the fears that cohabitation would have been fraught and difficult. Similarly, the limitations of the policy of ethnic uniformity in Israel and the colonization of Palestine shows the inadequacy resulting from the refusal to think of multinational states. And we could pursue, as John Chiriakandad has shown, the connections between Indian thinkers and Zionist by nationalists, um, as well as the connections between the Ali brothers and the Mufti in the 20s and 30s. Many have noted in passing how Indian Muslim reaction counted in the making of British policies on Palestine. These are other connections that can be examined to see our related history. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll have the opportunity to uh, ask you questions uh, after the presentation by Professor Kumara Swami. And uh, we'll have the next five minutes to go with Professor Swami. Thank you, Professor Swami. Uh, thank you, sir. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. <coughs> uh, until recently, uh, Indian scholars never draw a parallel between the Indian case and the Palestinian case. This has been dominated only by the Israelis who saw there is similarity between the two. In October 2016, when we was in Israel, our president made a very passing reference of almost of a sentence. He says something like, we both fought against the British. And I often think that imagine if this statement was made by Prime Minister Modi, what would have been the reaction both inside and outside the country? Because it is from the president who seemed to be more supportive of everyone, nobody took actually notice of the statement. There are a number of similarities people have been talking from the morning, so I'm not getting into this. I have too many things to say, let me make it as short as possible and as clear as possible. The first question about the UNSCOP. India was not nominated to the UNSCOP. If you look at the process, nine names have been suggested from the floor during the special session. India was not one of them. And India wanted to be a member of the commission. We'll come to that in a minute. And the reason was the anti-British position taken by the Indian representative, our ambassador in Washington, as a fully and his criticism of British policy and actions and is supposed to be pro-Arab position while the deliberations were taking place. Because of these reasons, he was, India was not nominated to the council. But India wanted to be a member even before the special session began on 14th of April. When the UN Senate uh, circulated the British request for a special session, and India wanted to be in the committee itself. That is, in addition to saying yes to the special session, we wanted to be member of the committee. And if you look at the deliberation, they said that the person we are looking for should be a Muslim and a legal background. Muslim, I understand, because India taught Palestine is predominantly a Muslim question. By sending a Muslim representative, you are communicating a message to the domestic audience. Why a lawyer? I have no clues. Because we are talking about April 1947. We don't know whether other countries will agree to the proposal, whether other countries will send their lawyer as a background, we have absolutely no proof. But in April, India was saying, we need to look for a Muslim and a lawyer. And they picked up uh, Abdul Rahman as his representative. This is for part. So once the committee started preparations, Abdul Rahman is mentioning, we have got uh, some of the other countries. They have given independence to their representative. I am also going to have the same space. I am free to make whatever suggestions I find to be correct. And Nehru wrote him back saying, Mr. Friend, you are not elected to the committee. 
India is elected to the committee and you are the nominee of the government of India. So you prepare the report according to what we say. And Abdul Rahman was still not very really sure, he was negotiating. August was into the picture. So sometime in early August he writes, with a partition coming, India's membership will become questioned. I was talking to people, my colleagues in the committee. So what I intend to do is, I will write a report see them and hand it over to the head of the committee and let them open after 14. Whatever happens in South Asia. Once again, they will be voting back saying, once again, you are wrong. India is elected. You are our nominee. You say according to what we suggest. So in other words, the United, the federal plan of India was Nehru's brainchild. It is Nehru who put the parameters of the it was in line with the Communist Party's position since the early 30s. They were saying, we are talking about a solution to the Palestinian question with certain autonomous rights to the Jews. This Congress Party was saying from the 1930s. So when you talk about the, the UNSCOP plan, it is nothing to do with Abdul Rahman. It is not his personal capacity. It is a government of India's plan. And you only give a legal position on that. Broad parameters were set by them. The most interesting thing was, when Abdul Rahman signed the agreement, the even partition plan, it was 1st September. That is, two weeks after India was partitioned along religious lines. This is where the problem comes. You know, you are not ready to accept a federal plan in India. You are not ready to accept, you know, two people could actually coexist, coexist in India. But you are exactly asking the same thing in distant Pakistan. I think that is where the dilemma comes. You know, we all know that, you know, the trust with destiny speech Nehru made in the in Delhi. But where was Gandhi? Gandhi was seen to be the person, the, the architect of India's freedom movement. You are supposed to be the one who delivered the freedom. Then was he on the 15th of August? Not in Delhi. If you look at it, Gandhi was not what in Indian terminology we use, the curry leaf. You know, you add the curry leaf to add up to the spice. Once it is served on your plate, the first thing is you drop the curry leaf out of your plate. That's exactly Gandhi was on 15th of August. Gandhi was necessary for a freedom movement. And he was, his utility was done after 46. Nobody listened to him after that. Because, you know, you have the dynamics are entirely different. Gandhi wanted to unite with India, he was ready to make compromises. Nobody was ready, no, no, it's not going to work. Fine, I have no issues with that. Sometimes, you know, divorce, however painful, is better. Rather than simply coexisting with people who don't agree on a lot of things. And people have been talking about the, the deeply divided society. Yes, 70 years later, let's not forget, partition did not divide. We were divided even before that. I don't believe that the British divide and rule policy. We divided their own. It's not the British came and divided Indians. Let's not pretend that. So our divisions were there before partition, during partition, after partition. So we need to talk about divisions, you know, linking up, it needs a lot of report to do that. Linking the division with partition, I have my own reservations on that. Whatever it is paid food. But Nehru was saying federal India, that is federal Palestine, but partition India. But the interesting thing is, Nehru was aware of the divisions in Palestine. Because Abdul Rahman was sending detailed reports to Nehru, and Nehru was actually reading it. You can see the Nehru signature in the archival reports. It's there. Nehru was signed with this particular reports. What was Abdul Rahman saying? He was saying, the Arabs and Jews they don't agree on anything. And he said, they don't even buy bread from the same shop. And he said, there are only three places the Arabs and Jews coexist. The British government, the Dead Sea works and the Eiffel Revival. These are the two places you will find Arabs and Jews under the same platform. And then he says, this is a strange place. There are two communist parties. One for the Arabs, one for the Jews. You know, Nehru was aware how deeply divided the Palestinian society in 1947 was. And we know that. Reference has been made in the morning. And when the British decided to leave on the 14th of uh, May 1948, there was no Palestinian leader in Palestine. We can argue on the reason. They were everywhere except in Palestine. You can say that from 1939 onwards, they were discourse experts, but the fact of the matter is nobody was. 
And how we are going to have a federal arrangement? And if you saw, in the Jewish agency was reasonably democratic from the mid 30s. Because the Jewish agency took over, if you are observing Palestine in 1947, you can actually put up a cabinet. Who will take over which ministry once the state is created? And the federal the partition plan also talk about a potential capital, Tel Aviv. And there is no, there are the Palestinian state, they don't know which one would be the capital. When they talked about as two state, but they were not even sure which one would be the cap, potential capital for Palestinian state. The asymmetry was huge. The social differences are huge. And that is why the Palestinian, the partition plan said, they are too intense nationalism, they cannot coexist, let them separate. They very clearly said, they are a genuine, legitimate national movements, both fighting for the same piece of territory. But the federal plan looked very different. The federal plan was a compromise between partition and the unitary state, which was demanded by the Arabs. But which basically means you need an enormous cooperation. Otherwise, you can't enforce it. How are you going to enforce cooperation when the democratic setup was completely different? When the people don't even agree on anything else, they don't even interact with the society, how are we are going to actually enforce partition? And while the UN storm was deliberating, the Arab community in Palestine refused to testify. So they had to have a session in Beirut. So the neighboring Arab states came and testified. The one person was missing, King Abdullah, Abdullah, he was not there. So the Indian representative, Abdul Rahman, goes to Aman to meet the king. So they had a dinner and then he says, they had a conversation and the report he says was, he is more inclined towards a partition of Palestine if he is going to get more territories of Palestine. That is what Abdullah's position, this is what Abdul Rahman communicated to him. But knowing everything, and he come up and say, federal Palestine. I think that's a major drawback. The second drawback was explaining the Indian position. Abdul Rahman writes an enormous report saying that, you know, a religion does not constitute a state. I think this is what the Indian position has been, the Congress Party's position. The Congress Party was saying, the moment you accept the Muslim League's position, Muslims are a different group and therefore a different nation. The moment you concede this argument, you are opening up Pandora's box. You are saying the Sikhs are a separate nation, Buddhists are a separate nation. If you look at Hinduism, which Hinduism you are talking about? Not South, East, West, which one you are talking about? So you are going to open up Pandora's box saying, every people who are different from others may become a different nation. And India probably would have ended up 600 countries, the largest bloc in the United Nations today. I think that is what Congress Party was afraid of. So they extended the same logic to Palestine. Just like in India we said a different religion does not make different nation, we are going to say the argument that just the Jews are a different people, they don't constitute a different nation. That is what is plain and simple argument. And that is why even today if you look at it, the majority of people, both in the Middle East and elsewhere, they look at Jews as a religious group, not as a national group. The moment you talk about national group, you have arguments become very different. So the Congress Party was saying Muslims are a different religion, but they don't become a different nation. The same thing, Jews are a different religion, therefore they don't become a different nation. This was the Congress Party's position, you would say, from the early 1930s. And reflecting on this, Abdul Rahman says about religion is different, he writes about long explanation that how the uh, Jews being a different group do not constitute a different nation. The interesting thing was, shortly after writing this report, he packs his bag and goes to Pakistan and becomes a judge of the uh, Karachi High. So in other words, both at the national level, even at the level of your representative, what you say and what you do are two different things. You are not able to walk the top, both Nil and uh, Abdul Rahman. And if you look at it, the uh, partition plan had one distinct advantage. The partition plan was supported by the Zionists. India was completely naive in international relations, which I think valid even today when people talk about India as a great power. We never had a great power in the historical sense of the name. Term. So you don't know which point of time I'm going to look for. So in 1947, we had a very naive way of looking at it. You thought, you know, when you are right, everybody will support you. That's not the case. So when India put up the federal plan, 
the Arabs did not accept it because it gave more rights to Jews than they were ready to give. So for a time, you know, we were talking uh, Jews to the, uh, the Balfour and everything had to go, the Indian plan grants a more right. The Jews are also rejected the plan saying that we were fighting for sovereignty, you are giving me municipal rights. And if you look at it, United Nations, no matter how you look at it, it's a political body, it's not a legal entity. And the members of sovereign states. The sovereign states behave according to the, what they consider to be national interest. And therefore, when you are putting a proposal to the United Nations, the first thing you should do is, let's be a straw poll. If I'm putting up this proposal, how many guys will accept this? India was completely new and naive with international diplomacy. There are absolutely no proof. Just because you thought it was the right thing, everybody will support. No. So with the result, Yugoslavia which supported the Indian plan, when the voting came, they abstained. They were the first one to recognize India. The federal plan is largely or even primarily Nehru's branch of and Yugoslavia and Iran merely signed it up. Because Iranian ambassador wrote to the, UN, the head of the UN, and my government has given this freedom to suggest whatever I want to do without any inference or input from my government. So therefore, Iran and Yugoslavia simply signed up what we are doing. So what you have got in the end is, the Arabs did not accept because it gave too many rights to the Jews. And the Jews did not accept because it's too little rights. You know guys, in 1947, the only thing the Arabs and Jews agreed was say no to India. That's the only thing they agreed. And that is why even today, the federal plan is never discussed even by academia. Because to have a credibility, you have to have somebody's acceptance. There's nothing about that. Academic people simply, is what I would call, it's a dustbin of history. Nobody will look at it. It's not a question whether it's feasible or not. Because at the end of the day, to work a federal plan, you need a greater cooperation between the people. With all the imperfections. At least a sizable section of the Muslim opted to stay in India. They could have opted for Pakistan citizenship. They didn't do it. They opted to stay in India, which is not the case in Pakistan. And in those circumstances, to come up and tell me that you need to have a federal arrangement is simply an unviable proposition. But in the South Asian context, the, the proximity may be more realistic. You recognize that, you know, okay, we need to have the partition. Suppose if I say I want only a federal India, the independence would be an open-ended question, would have way wrong. For a variety of reasons, you wanted independence immediately. And therefore, you are ready to pay the price. Okay, partition is the case, let me pay the price. But in the distant Palestine, you can take a moral idea. No, 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 partition is bad, you don't become a different religion, both of the Hindus are at a collective level. You are where you can actually sermonize the world, saying that no oh, federal arrangement is good. Without recognizing, how we are going to enforce the two people to even talk to each other? I think that is where the Indian plan have actually collapsed. So when the plan went to the United Nations, the UN appointed two committees. One committee to discuss the partition plan, and the other committee to discuss not the federal plan. The unitary state suggested by Arab countries. And they simply, within 24 hours, they submitted the report. And the unitary committee was headed by Pakistan. And Zafrullah Khan, reference has been made. He made a very eloquent speech, and all of them he supported the Arab countries and everything. But in the climax of the story is, in his own country, he died a cough because Ahmadiyyas were declared non So that is what the irony of all of them is. If you look at this, is he present. So Indian plan never ever got to the United Nations. Nobody discussed about it. And I think that is even today. Indian academia don't even look at it. Why did that? If you have such a great plan, why nobody thought it? Nehru comes to the, uh, the constant assembly and says, no, we made a proposal to the partition plan. And his wording was, even Arabs rejected it. So by the time they recognize it's going to be a good, it didn't work. And India got another opportunity. That was in the second session of the UN General Assembly. May 1948. US and others were simply trying, let's somehow find a trusteeship, somehow freeze the partition movement. 
India actually jumped into the country. She said, okay, at least one more chance to actually find a way to freeze the partition resolution. India was India and the United States actually were cooperating with each other to find a way so that we could freeze the partition resolution of 1947. But that is what's happening and the American ambassador was speaking and suddenly somebody walks in and say, give a piece of paper and he says, the state of Israel is declared and two minutes, the paper. And the, 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 special, uh, the, the general assembly session took a short break and then never met. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will of course open for uh, Q&A straight away. Just two uh, quick points from, from what you said. I mean, basically I thought your thesis was that, uh, that uh, uh, Nehru was, uh, uh, was not intellectually honest. Federation in Palestine and division in India. Is that what you're saying? Because if, if it is so, uh, I'm not absolutely sure because if Nehru might have been thinking of a post Pakistan India, because on the 14th of August, the Muslims of India uh, became a part of Pakistan. The rest of India was federal, uh, it was union. Uh, so, why is it intellectually dishonest? to actually want a union in India, which India wants, and India implies the union, so the upper house, Sivajya Sabha is at the, at the lower house, and you wanted a federation in, in, uh, in, Pal uh, in Palestine. So, it, it was the same thing. I mean, before 14th of uh, August, it was different, yes. But once Pakistan had walked out of India, India was a union or a federation. I mean, you could argue that it's a union or a federation. But Nehru probably wanted the same kind of arrangement just as he wanted a secular India, perhaps a, some kind of a secular Palestine as well. Number two, what does it matter to, to us or the rest of the world? I mean, this is that the extrapolation has to be of something wider than Nehru as a person. It has to be relevant to be of any uh, value, academic value, to be greater, to cover a, a more general, uh, uh, to widen that general area, attachment area. If you are just talking to one person and saying that, okay, this person was not honest because he wanted one thing for his own country and he wanted another for a distant land. But it doesn't matter to you and me or the rest of the people here. Uh, anything to be of, of uh, interest would have to have wider ramifications. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, like you can't just extrapolate Indians walk and see the file of 30 years so uh, that's uh, one point. But the Federation was never discussed in Palestine, right? Uh, so it, it, it is not politically such an important thing. I mean, you make a very strong intellectual point in some ways, but, but it, probably the relevance, the actual political relevance is not as much as uh, you have made out. That's one. You might. Uh, with uh, I, I didn't quite get the law part. I mean, the, the, the Roman law and common law. Shortly after, uh, after uh, uh, the crown taking over India, you have the CRPC, you have the PPC, you have the Evidence Act. All these are part of common law. So the basic tenets of Indian legal system are based on common law. Uh, am I right? Yes. Yeah. That's what I refer to. Okay. So you agree with that, but we want to uh, react with it. So that's what I said from 1857. After May, yeah. after May, reorganization. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't say that the international way is on. So I think, you know, I, I, I don't know if you get it. But I would say that, you know, as a politician, we have adopted two different positions. And one can also say that, you know, one of the first statements after a partition from Vietnam was, you know, was Muslim in Sister. Sister. Sorry. 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 Uh, one of the.
I'm, I'm not saying it's uh, intellectual dishonesty or anything, but I'm looking as a politician, he had adopted two different positions. And the immediate nature of partition and geographical proximity made him to be more realistic. And you know, in a distant level, you can take a moral position. I think that's exactly what Nehru was doing. It's not because of it. And Nehru was also reflecting a situation. If you look at from 1930s onwards, the Palestinian question is becoming a domestic Indian agenda. Muslim League was organized in the Pakistan day, and similarly, the Congress Party was doing the same thing. So the, in, the Congress Muslim League rivalry over Palestine and transcending the Indo Pak rivalry after 47. So I think that's why the question. On the larger issues, basically, I, I was looking at the, it's not a push of Nehru's position or the individual position. India was completely unfamiliar with the unfolding events in the region. You merely carried out the rivalry with the uh, Muslim League and later on Pakistan to the United Nations. That's why you are afraid. Right. Right. No, no. Uh, I'm familiar with how the international relations are working. The same thing. United Nations is a body of sovereign states. So therefore, there the decision will be taken at a different level. It's not a rights and wrongs, it's a different level. And the same reason, I don't know whether they would have referred the Kashmir question to United Nations 10 years later. Had it been in 1950s and 60s, he would not have done it. In 55, 49, he said, pretty naive in that sense, you refer the matter and you recognize it. It's not simple, straight line. I think that is one of it. You carry it over your rivals. And that is why you need a Muslim and a lawyer as you were representing in the special session, or as you were representing in Lance Hall. I think that tells you it, it's basically the internal rivalry with the Muslim League. He carried on to this, and he thought Palestine is an important question. It is true that Palestine was the most important event at the end of the Second World War. You recognize the fact. But to say that you need to be a Muslim and a lawyer, <coughs> once again you are carrying out the domestic Indian contest with the lead into the international league. I think that is what I would need. Thank you. Okay. I'm opening Should it to... I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go back to the so. Roman law. I mean, I agree that it's common law from 50s. I mean, it was common law courts. But the idea of personal law and to represent Hindus and Muslims and use their laws in, came from the side, uh, uh, from the Roman law ideas as well. So they are using both concepts in India, yeah. not just uh, the Of course, you law. see, in India is an, an amalgam of naked sovereignties uh, through the British period. You see, because uh, they were, you were leaving out lots of the states which were there. I mean, it's, when you say British India, the three presidents. I just want to comment uh, on this discussion yeah. about, the, uh, about difference and the way it's been managed. I just want to, as a historian, just want to put this on the table, that difference is not something that was uh, discovered uh, by the colonial state or anything, uh, but I do think that the attitude towards difference is quite different. Uh, let's take the Ottoman Empire, let's take the Mughal Empire. Uh, difference was a reality that was given. Uh, it was not an issue, it was not a problem. These were multi-ethnic, multinational states. Uh, the problem becomes, it's almost sort of coeval with the construction or the construct of the modern nation state that claims a homogeneity where difference becomes a problem. In other words, uh, if you are going to sort of demand rights of citizenship, equal rights of citizenship, and you are uh, still insisting on your difference, then that's a problem. So you're moving from a non-problematic idea of difference to a problematized problem, in short. And therein lies the, the, the many of the issues that you're struggling with. Uh, and I'm not trying to suggest that we need to go back, uh, but I do need to point out that this construct of difference is a construct and nothing more than that. And human beings have the capacity to rethink difference. Yeah, I, I agree that we can rethink it, and that's the by problematizing difference, I think I was trying to do the same thing, that we need to see the history of how these differences have been uh, posited as, uh, as irreconcilable, and we, I hope with that we can be... Oh, I mean, you are dealing with the modern uh, nation state yes. and its constructs, and that is the problem. It is not as if these are suddenly, the problems have aggravated or appeared, it's the way in which you are interpreting these problems. If you have, I mean, if you have an attitude towards life, as the British did, that they already knew what was wrong with India, and so they went around finding the evidence to prove it. I mean, there's one way of studying it, we're seeing the problem and trying to understand its complexities, and the other is, uh, if, if it's not the British, it's the modern nation state. 
uh, uh, you can decide. It's a very hard answer. Uh, whether it's the colonial state that did it, or I mean, after all, the Ottomans were doing the same. Uh, so the, the issue really here is, is the very entity of the modern nation state and its way of proceeding. Can you change it? The corruption on the same issue, is it? The corruption? Yes. Yeah. I, if it follows up on, on this point, um, I, I think it's a very, it's very interesting idea. And I'm wondering, too, if there are also ways to think about difference in the corruption of differences. The, 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 some of them are not working, so I think we need to. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Um, I think there are the colonial state in Palestine and probably in India as well um, is a place where the production of difference also is essentially instrumentalist. So I was thinking about in Palestine, there's a, an example of this that in that the British, when they came in and conducted the first census in Palestine in 1922, they used the three categories that you referenced. Jewish, Muslim, and Christian. By the mid-1930s, under pressure by the Zionists to press for what they called parity and legislative representation, right, so equal numbers of Jews and Arabs, they moved to collapse the categories of Muslim and Christian into a single census category of Arab. So it's an example of the ways in which that that is not actually, I'm not sure they even their own essentialist rhetoric about what, what was happening, but rather it was useful politically at that moment to decide that the essential categories that could then be presented as kind of primordial um, and, you know, existing for a plan. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah. you have to write, I mean, the British also, I mean, in their own context, uh, there were there were Catholics and Protestants, but they chose not to enumerate on the basis of Protestants and, and Catholics, even if they had a fairly good idea of who was who. Uh, but the census enumeration they did was a capital H Hindu and a capital M Muslim. Uh, comprising these capital H's were several subcasts in the case of the Hindus and people who subscribed to the Islamic faith but identified as Afghans, Persians, Turks, and what, whatever you want. Uh, I just want to say that throughout the discussion, what I've been, we've talked about religion, but perhaps what hasn't been made clear enough is the issue of the region. And therein may lie the conundrum that Professor Kumar Samawi is referring to, uh, that, that in order to keep Punjab and Bengal and the other Muslim majority states did require a federal solution that Nehru did not want to touch because that would affect his own power. But he had no qualms about proposing certain. So I actually didn't think that there was a major problem with what Professor Kumar Samawi was saying. I wonder whether you want to. Uh, okay, yeah, Mishra. Yeah. Firstly, uh, my, my point is that, uh, Professor, I found your, your thesis uh, rather strange because you actually uh, never, uh, in India's entire position on Israel as a matter between you know, partition or federalism. But I, I think uh, okay, well, one fact is that the size you, that, that has to be taken into in consideration, you know, the size of Israel and India. The, the other factor is that I, um, you, I think you discounted uh, ideology as a factor because there's one very strong similarity between Israel and Pakistan is that um, both, 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 both of these countries actually um, is based on the idea of uh, religion as a basis of religion as a basis of nation which um, India rejects that, that, that idea. I mean, uh, yeah. So, so that uh, you now. The, the, <laughs> yeah, they make things change. Anyway, this is this is why why Jinnah created Pakistan to see if, um, to say Pakistan from this. So I think I, 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 the, the ideological factor or something that you didn't take into account, I think even uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi made, made a statement where, where he said that he, um, that he, he on rejecting the, the idea as religion as a piece of nationhood. So, I mean, do, do you think you, you gave too much of attention on, on partition and uh, federalism? And the, the, just to conclude, that the thing that you said that Nehru actually preferred um, partition. Your, your reference point was directly to, to Nehru rejecting the cabinet mission plan. And I, I, that, 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 that's one part that I thought it might be a little flaw. I think uh, I said it very clearly that uh, when Nehru opposed the Jewish nationalism in Palestine, this is a continuation of the Congress policy to work. Religion does not constitute national identity. That is what the Congress position has been. That is what Nehru was reflecting in 47. He said no to Indian context. He said no to Palestinian context. 
But having said that, when you recognize, you know, you are not going to get the India you want, you are not ready to pay for the Gandhi's India. You wanted to have a partition, one where I am going to be chief architect. So that's the time you say, okay, partition is a fight. So that is what I am saying, it's a pragmatic in the Indian context. In spite of the fact, ideologically both are same. Personally, I think, you know, Israel is more closer to Pakistan in ideological term than to India. If you look at the whole range of issues, between personal characters of Jinnah as well as David, David ben Gurion, both are completely, they are unfamiliar with their own faiths. In the, in the religious sense, they don't understand their faith. So if there are a lot of similarities between Pakistan and Israel and India and Israel. If you look at the evolution of the state, in every sense of it. But it's a continuation of it. Two fingers from Professor Dilal. Yes, well, uh, I just want to add uh, that this remarkable solution that everybody is talking about, Mr. Jinnah's ideological commitment to a quote-unquote Muslim state, I think everybody should hear, should remember, that in the year 2050, India will emerge as the largest Muslim country in the world. Uh, so I really would like to say that this remarkable uh, discussion that we are having about this man's ideological commitment, I mean, I think what's completely sort of elided your imagination is the fact of regional identities as well, and how important regions were in the denouement of 1947. That's the problem with partition historiography. That's the problem with how you talk about partition and what lessons you choose to take away from it. Yeah. Could there be a minority rule in that? It was a small point. Yeah. So no. could, could there be a minoritarian mm -hmm. dominance of that Muslim majority state in India in 2015? Oh, but there but, is no concentration yeah. of Muslim, but why are you still hanging on the Muslim issue? The question is regional power. It's the question of how the regional powers, I mean, how the regional peoples choose to share power, and not only amongst themselves, but also with the higher levels, i.e. at the central level. Uh, but I think this obsession, I mean, I, I want to repeat that Jinnah thought that this issue of the religion factor would go away in the post independence period. Yeah. But partition makes sure that it never would. That's what I was saying. And, you know, if, if you look at it, before 47, India had the largest Muslim population in the world under the British. So if what you are saying is 2050 are going to the largest Muslim state in the world, that's also a good news. It's not a bad news. No, no, no. Exactly. But the issue is really in the what sense, happened in between. Which, which means in an inclusive India. Which means inclusive India. No matter Hindu majority, yes, in the largest population, yes, but it's still an inclusive India, no matter how you look at it. We don't know how inclusive it is. But we can argue. We can argue because if I look at it, which reference are you going to indicate? No, no. Are you going to indicate which is a model state for me? Some United States? Or the French? Or the Belgian? Or the British? Which is a model state for me? Or Pakistan, or Bangladesh, which is a model state. I so if you look at it, I would say that you know, mine as a model state. Certainly, I It is a possibility. Uh, yes, sir. What? Yeah. One interesting point that none of the presenter uh, talked about. Yeah. This the origins of Muslims in India and the origins of uh, Jewish in Palestine. There is a big, big difference how these people, like Jewish, started to immigrate to Palestine since maybe 18th century during the Ottoman. They're guys nice for you. Exactly. While the Muslim in India, I guess I, I don't have a lot of information, but I think this makes a big difference. Why there is a people who are already living on the land, which is the Muslim Christians in Palestine, or there is Jewish as well, while the other Christ, uh, Jewish that come from diaspora to Palestine, but on the other hand, Indians have already a big population of Muslims people there. So that's also should be considered when the differences and similarities between these two cases. Yeah, that's what you're saying that it began in Basel and then traveled to Russia and Austria, Germany. Yeah, and Poland yeah. and all the other parts. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Katan, you have some knowledge. You have a specialist. Sorry. I know. I had a question for Professor Shona. Um, the, the sort of parallels that he mapped out, and this is obviously this is just a larger question, I think, for the workshop. Um, because I think we're, we keep sort of shifting back and forth between what's particular about a case and what's similar across cases. Um, and it struck me, you know, you, you mapped out, I think, in a really kaleidoscopic way, a whole set of parallels. Right? And to me, it, it struck me that these were parallels of rule 
um, whether they were British rule or, or sort of post-colonial rule. Um, but then I started wondering, okay, so given these similarities, how do we explain what's actually very different outcomes? Um, right, we've got one case of actual partition and one case of failed partition, but then even in the post-partition period, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the stuff that um, Kidar and um, Foreman have done, right? On that sort of movement of um, laws from Europe to India to um, Palestine is really interesting. So we get parallels of post-colonial law as well. Um, but do we, do we see do we then see partition as something that doesn't have to happen in the same way everywhere? Um, is it, are we talking about um, partition as a mentality? Are we talking about partition as a kind of legal, like socio-legal practice that then manifests itself in different ways in different places? I don't know, it's something I wanted to get your thoughts on. Well, that's a very good question, and it is also, uh, it's also, just the fact that they are similar, the same people working in both places, what does it mean for commonality or what does it mean for uh, understanding the processes? I, I, I take the question very well that it's uh, what we make of these similarities and continuities. And, uh, I just, so that's, I, I feel that if you know them as system, systemic, then you can problematize them and see them not as emerging from particular solutions to particular places. That you recognize that these are uh, widespread practices of governance, both in international law as well as in particular places. So that was really the idea that you could see it more than just India and Pakistan, you could see it beyond these places as well. And whether the outcome of partition and how what that means for commonality, then, I mean, that's the particular histories that the contingencies that have to be also recognized. That you cannot, just because you have the same laws, doesn't mean you have the same outcomes. Because the individual groups are different, the circumstances are different uh, as well. So, yeah. But just to have similarities, not to have the sameness. Sorry, I just picked up what the gentleman behind me was saying, or I think he was saying, is that it wasn't just that the Jews were diasporic. Um, I think one of the arguments that the Palestinians made, Palestinian lawyers were making in 1947 against partition was that many of um, Jewish immigrants were not even citizens of, of Palestine, and therefore they're saying you are dividing up the country um, you know, between you know, a large population population immigrants and those who are, who are established citizens according to what they thought was unfair laws anyway that favored uh, Jewish uh, immigrants. So they're saying even on, on that logic, it, didn't, it was un grossly unfair. Um, I think that's what you were trying to say. Uh, uh, another thing, I was just wondering, the factors that uh, cause the differences, the differentia, aren't they somewhat transient sometimes? For example, in 1947, when India was partitioned, Muslims, okay, I mean, Jinnah's argument was by name and nomenclature, art and architecture, whatever, by every canon of international definition, we are a nation. And Calcutta and Bengal, Bengal was in the forefront of the Pakistan movement. Over 40 years, uh, as things evolved and everything is in a flux, I mean, the Bengalis thought, okay, there were Muslims all right, and there were also Bengalis. So the, the factor of there being Bengali and there being Muslims at the same time created a set of differences which caused, uh, led to a claim of yet another partition. So, I mean, everything is in a state of flux in some ways, isn't it? So, uh, these factors will eventually ch change over time and things will change. Like, for example, uh, India may not, be the, may not have the kind of secular values uh, which, are pre which are preponderant now as they were time during the Congress. Perhaps when the Congress comes back again, uh, which might be the case next year, <laughs> to go back to the, the old values. <laughs> Uh, there, was, there was one question that you asked in the morning and you were saying at lunch that it remained unanswered and it was probably asked of Professor Talmud. The, uh, the, uh, the question about the Indian Army. Uh, what happened to the Army in 1947? Is that what you asked? Okay. There was a British uh, Indian Army, which is probably an Imperial Army. What was the command structure like? Uh, a Viceroy who ceased to be Viceroy and became Governor General of India. 
in, uh, on the 15th of August, still commander, was he still the commander in chief of the British Army? And did the armies in India and Pakistan report to the same, the same uh, headquarters? I mean, there, there was a, a joint uh, headquarters set up during the division, because of course the division in the Indian Army had been completed. This is one of the issues uh, that the British saw as a real problem. Uh, this hadn't been completed because obviously Mount Patton moved forward the date uh, of partition, but uh, Auchinleck was the supreme commander uh, of both uh, forces that were being reconstituted uh, while this whole process of partition was going on. But of course, uh, this was wound up, the supreme headquarters, very soon. Uh, after uh, partition, because Auchinleck was claimed by both sides to be favouring the other. So he's probably doing a reasonable job as a result of that joint criticism. And I mean, this again is where um, the rapid emergence of the Kashmir issue as a dispute um, impacts and cuts across uh, so many things in South Asia. But I think the British really wanted to have this joint command uh, in order to ease the process of the division of, of, of the armies and also perhaps to, to get some kind of a still a joint defense of the subcontinent by India and Pakistan against the possible Soviet um, threat. So Mr. Jinnah as Governor General had no control over the army of Pakistan or the country or the United the, there was obviously a Pakistan commander-in-chief, there was a joint commander-in-chief. These were the people who were actually making the decisions um, in terms of uh, what was happening as far as the army was concerned. Is that all right? Okay. Uh, yeah, we were about the secular some part. Uh, in a sense, you know, uh, this is a struggle like democracy, you have to go through it on a daily basis. It's not that, you know, you can just declare, okay, I'm going to be secular, I'm going to be democratic one day and I'll take a, a weekend off. Right? This is a struggle India, any other country have to go to. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's not a question of whether Modi comes back to power or not comes to power. That's not an issue. The issue is whether India stays on the secular path. But if you look at globally, there are a lot of countries where the secular space is shrink. I think that's a dangerous thing. It's not just in India. You just pick up a, any country you want to take, take a look at it. The secular space that is willingness to accept the other is shrinking. If you look at in the entire Arab and Islam in the Middle East, you say Dini is predominant framework today. They don't have other framework. Look at the constitution and take a call. So if you look at the secular space, that is the acceptance of the other is shrinking. I think that's a greater threat. It's a greater because we're talking about India, it looks much better. Yes, it is a, it is an issue which I face it on a daily basis in my own university. So the social public space is shrinking for a variety of reasons. But I think that is need to be fought, it's no matter who is at the helm of us. That's going to change. Okay, uh, the floor is still open, and uh, Jim Dorsey has just walked in, but I don't think he has followed the uh, discussion, so he won't ask a question. So in which case, uh, all that is left to me is to thank the very distinguished panelists for a very, very stimulating for leading a very stimulating discussion on all sides, and we covered uh, many topics. Uh, uh, so now I don't uh, always answer questions. Uh, uh, seminars are meant to provoke uh, thinking, and uh, you have uh, done that. And, uh, sometimes, of course, we have talked about confusions, but uh, all of us who may be confused by one point or another are most certainly confused with the higher intellectual level at this point in time. <laughs> so, so, uh, if there have been no other questions, once again, thank you very much. Uh, shall we pass seamlessly to the next uh, uh, Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary and distinguished panelists. We will now proceed for a short tea break. May I request everyone to kindly clear the room as there will be an interview session here. Please be back by 3.45 p.m. Thank you.